Well, good morning to everybody. And uh, the one thing we all have in common, every single person in the room, no matter if you're one years old or you're 101 years old, we all came from a mom. We all came from a mom. And um, Pastor Luke mentioned it, but I would not be where I am today without a mother and her faith in Jesus. And the Bible talks about women who have a faith in Jesus and the impact it made in a child's life. A grandmother's faith, a mother's faith. Uh, can we honor all of our moms in our life? Can we just honor every, all, all the moms? I know we did that just a little bit ago. Uh, we all have that in common. We all share that in common. We all have a mom. And uh, man, if you study the Bible at all, you'll notice the Apostle Paul right away when he writes letters, he, he talks about the reports that he's heard about the churches. And he says usually, I thank God for you. I thank Christ Jesus for you. Um, because he hears the reports. Um, I'm in a different church every weekend across America. Um, I'm somewhere else all the time. And know what I hear regularly about New Hope Church is I hear about the reports of what God is doing in this church. Please, please don't miss this. Please don't miss this. What is happening through you, what is happening through this church is literally impacting the nations. And so I want to say this, on behalf of the reports that I'm hearing, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for giving so others may have life. Thank you for sacrificing so others may know the gospel. Thank you for loving your next door neighbor and inviting them to church. Thank you for being the church of Jesus Christ. New Hope, keep going in Jesus. Can we honor Jesus and give it up for Jesus? Incredible what God's doing right here in this church. And the Bible not only talks about descriptions and reports of churches, the Bible also talks about honoring and honoring leaders and honoring elders. Church, can we clap and give it up for our lead pastors, Pastor Weaver and the Hills, who are leading our church and their leadership right here for the years of faithfulness. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Thank you to the team, Pastor Brian and Luke and Zach August. All the pastors on staff, this is an amazing, amazing church. If you are a first-time visitor, you haven't been here before, I just want to say welcome home. Uh, if you're looking for a church, I really hope this ends up being the church. Uh, Pastor Luke mentioned it. Uh, I travel full-time as an evangelist. Uh, an evangelist who's someone who, uh, that God gives to equip the church to do the work of the ministry. And so um, over the last seven years, I have not done this alone, uh, but this is a picture of my wife, Stephanie Joy. That's my wife, Stephanie Joy. We met at North Central University, and we just celebrated 12 years of marriage, everybody. Hey, that's Steph. And... Um, she is in Wisconsin today with her mother, but the reason why I show you my wife is um, you don't just travel and preach the gospel without someone back home who gives you the support and the anchor for you to go. And so I want to show honor to my wife. Um, and so she sends us, she knew I was going to be gone. She gave me the blessing to go. How many of you know, if you want a good marriage, you need to ask your wife permission. You don't just go on Mother's Day. You got to ask permission. Uh, that's my wife. This is a picture of our baby, Everly, and uh, there she is. And my wife, she's a worship leader, and uh, she has to be early at church to practice for worship. She said, Micah, would you dress our baby this morning, get her ready for church? I left out clothes for the baby. I just said, how hard is it to dress a baby? It's really not that difficult. So I dress my baby like that. I bring her to church. And these moms are staring at me in the lobby, and I know why they're staring at me, because I did a good job, and my baby looks cute. My baby's adorable. And this mom walks up to me. She's like a Holly Tower. She looks at me and she goes, did you dress your baby this morning? I said, I sure did. And I did a good job, didn't I? And she looks at me and real graciously, she goes, Micah, I just need to let you know something. In Minnesota, where I'm from, we're all what's called Minnesota nights, super passive aggressive, okay? She goes, Micah, I just need to let you know something. I go, yeah, what's up? She goes, when you dress a baby, the first thing you do is put on the onesie, and then you put on the pants, okay? If you're a man in the audience and you saw nothing wrong with that photo, well, neither did I. Neither did I. 
Does the baby have clothes on it? Yeah, it does. Then the baby's fine. Is the baby warm? Yeah, the baby's warm, then the baby's fine. Supposedly, there's all these methods to dress some babies nowadays. This is an updated picture of my little girl, Everly. She is seven. She's finishing her first grade year. And then this is my little boy, Malachi David. He's five. And uh, I surprised my wife because I preached in Iowa Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night for your youth here. And so um, I had a day in between where I was going to stay in Iowa on Saturday. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to drive home Friday night in the middle of the night and go scare my wife and bring her flowers for Mother's Day. There's an 80-year-old woman. I'm not going to point her out. Or there's a woman in the audience right now. She just did this. No, no. Don't scare your wife. What are you doing? Well, I scared her. I brought flowers. And um, she was so thankful but terrified at the same time. And I um, surprised her for Mother's Day yesterday. We took her to breakfast and just got a chance to honor her. But my boy Malachi, he goes, Dad, I want to go to Iowa with you, Dad. I want to go to Iowa with you. So I brought my little boy Malachi with me. Uh, he's back at the hotel. He'll be here next service. But my family has only known a dad who's traveled and preached. Uh, for the last seven years, we've traveled full-time and preached the gospel. And uh, we model our ministry after Billy Graham. Billy Graham prayed a prayer when he was young, and he said this, God, help me go where you want me to go, and help me be who you've called me to be. And we stole that prayer, and we've prayed that the last seven years. In the last seven years, we've seen over 25,000 people give their life to Jesus in our travel ministry, which has been incredible. It's been amazing, and we give God all the glory for that. Um, if you are new here today and you're just coming to church and checking things out, uh, we have been in a sermon series uh, titled The Holy Spirit. And um, Pastor Jeff kicked this off a couple weeks ago talking about the role of the Holy Spirit, the function of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a ghost. The Holy Spirit is the person of God. And Jesus prepped his believers that the Holy Spirit would come. He would be an advocate. He'd be a guide. He'd be a comforter. The Holy Spirit would be the teacher. You have God the Father. You have God the Son. You have God the Holy Spirit. Pastor Jeff gave a message about the role, the function of the Holy Spirit. And then the last couple of weeks, Pastor Austin uh, talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment that comes from the Holy Spirit, and then this accompaniment of tongues, being able to speak in tongues, praying in tongues, having the gift of tongues. Just so you know, if you are visiting, um, every week you will come and you will hear a message in the Bible because we believe the Bible is the word of God, the inspired word of God, and we believe what God has written in his word is for believers today to live out. Jesus came to this earth 2,000 years ago and said, it's better for me to leave because if I don't leave, then the Holy Spirit won't come. So if Jesus says that it's better for him to leave so the Holy Spirit can come, then I want what Jesus said was better. And what he said was better was that the Holy Spirit would come and fill you and give you a power to be his witness. So here's the deal, church. From whenever Jesus died and Pentecost happened and the Holy Spirit poured out, we are living right now in what's called the church age. Because when the Holy Spirit baptized 120 people and filled an upper room, that day something called the church was started. The church wasn't man's idea with rules and like reg reg regulations. The church was God's idea. It's called ecclesia, the people of God who'd be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So if you're wondering what plan A is for a lost and dying world, it was God's plan all along called the church that'd be full of the Holy Spirit and empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's good news, and you can clap for that because that's God's idea for the church. And so, Pastor Austin called me, said, Micah, you're preaching Sunday morning. I said, sounds great. I love preaching at this church. This church feels like family. But he goes, Micah, you can't bring your own message. I'm like, sounds good. He said, you need to stick in our series, the Holy Spirit series. We're teaching the church. And so he said, I want you to talk about this gift called the gift of healing. The gift of healing. And today, I want to start with our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 1. I love it. Starting in verse 1, it's on the screen if you do not have your Bibles, but starting in verse 1, Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. If you have no idea who the church of Corinth is, um, it's a really messed up, really interesting, 
really spirit-empowered church with a lot of issues, okay? Uh, the church of Corinth was on a seaport. Uh, there was a lot of traffic, a lot of people, a lot of different tribes, a lot of different ethnicities, a lot of different tongues, a lot of commas was there. The god of the city was a sex god. It was a prostitute god. Um, it was known for major prostitution. Not only that, the church is so dysfunctional that there are people sleeping with one another in inappropriate relationships Paul addresses that, and so this church is really practical, really emphasis on the gifts, but they got issues that they need to work out. So Paul writes this letter to the church in Corinth to bring correction, to bring order, to say, hey, here's what's going on. And when we get all the way to chapter 12, Paul has addressed a variety of different things, but now Paul intentionally addresses the church. They had this problem, and here's what the problem was. They had this overemphasis on tongues where they couldn't stop praying in tongues and it was tongues, 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 this prayer language. So Paul had to bring order and give instruction to this church to be able to help them navigate the gifts of the Spirit, okay? And so in our text today, we pick up where Paul now starts in verse 1 and this is what the Apostle Paul writes. He says, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. In other words, he says, some of you might be ignorant. Some of you might really not know what's going on, but I don't want you to be uninformed. That's the heart of a true pastor. It's the heart of a true shepherd. They want you to be informed. He says this in verse 2, you know that when you were pagan, somehow or other of you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Here's where we get into the gifts in verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Here we go in verse 7. This is when we get into the list. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through a spirit of message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge, by means of the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguished between spirits, to another speaking in different kind of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. God, thank you that you are not a God of confusion. Thank you that you're not a God of chaos. God, you are a God that empowers the church to be a witness, and you are a God that gives gifts, not to the gifted. You give gifts to every single person here. God, help us to walk in your power and in your order. In Jesus' name, everybody say it. Amen. The title of my sermon today is titled, God Still Heals Today. God Still Heals Today. That one statement can give a bag of emotions. There's people who say amen, yes, and then there might be people here who are like, I have a hard time with that because we just got done praying for my mom. My mom passed away. My mom clearly didn't die. There might be people in the audience today who have a disease and you've asked God for healing for years from this disease and you've got discouraged. So for some of us, seeing a sermon title today that says God still heals today might bring up a mix of emotions. Uh, growing up, there was a divorce that happened in my family. My mom divorced after 17 years of marriage. My dad left my mom for another woman. I watched drug abuse. I watched alcohol abuse. I watched affairs destroy a home. And then a single mom picked up the phone and said, where's the best church I can bring my kids to? I showed up to a church just like New Hope. I was a teenage boy. I didn't want to get out of the car. My mom said, kids, you need to get out of the car and go to church. There was four kids, single mom. You need to go to church. I looked at my mom. I said, mom, I'm not going to church. I'm staying right here. Mom, I'm not going into church. My mom grabbed a big burly man from the church with a nice beard, brought him out in the van, drug my butt into church. And little did I know, I'd end up meeting the best friend who would be the best man in my wedding that day at church. My mom knew that if there was a chance that her kids making it, it would be a single mom trying to bring her kids every church to Sunday. 
If you're a single mom in the audience today and you brought some kids to church, thank you. You're staring at a kid who's a product of a mom who brought her kids not knowing the outcome of their futures. But God did a major work. This single mom who was attempting to raise four kids was a stay-at-home mom for 17 years, worked multiple jobs, went to school full-time, very little money in the family, and then she got the worst news a single mom could ever hear. Her eight-year-old daughter that she was tucking in bed one night came across a big bump in her leg. My mom brought her to the hospital, found out it was a six-inch by eight-inch tumor wrapped around her femur bone. And the doctors did a biopsy. They found out it was stage four synovial cell sarcoma cancer. And the doctors looked at my eight-year-old sister and said, you have a 20% chance to live. My mom just watched her husband of 17 years walk out on her for divorce to marry another woman or to be with another woman. And now a single mom's told her eight-year-old daughter is going to die. This is a picture of my little eight-year-old sister. Her name's Victoria. She went through all the chemotherapy, all the radiation her little body could handle. The tumor spread to her lungs. She went through over 15 surgeries just on her lungs. There was no more medically that the doctor could do for this little girl. She's going to die. Make-A-Wish Foundation shows up, gives my sister a wish. Her wish is to go swim with the dolphins in Florida before she passes away. We get our wish as a family. An evangelist comes to my church. Our church had been praying for a miracle for two years. No miracle. It got worse. Church had been praying for a breakthrough. No breakthrough. It got worse. She's going to die. An evangelist came to my church, looked at my 10-year-old sister who'd been battling for two years, and said, young lady, young lady, one day you're going to come. You're going to come to my church in Tennessee, and you're going to give a testimony on how God healed you of your cancer. We've been praying for two years and nothing. We went to a back room. We just prayed one more time. My sister went to the hospital to get scans of where the tumors had gone. When the doctor held up the scans in the operating room, they found out there were no more tumors in her body whatsoever. She's been cancer-free for over 15 years. And the doctors call her the miracle child. And the doctors are dumbfounded. My sister now leads worship every single Sunday in the very church she was healed in for hundreds of people. And my sister ended up getting married, and the doctors told her you'll never have a child because the cancer treatment you did as a little girl impacted your ability to conceive and have a child. My sister's dream was to live, but my sister's dream was to have a baby of her own, and now she's told she'll never have a baby. My sister and her husband tried for years. No baby. This is a picture of her miracle baby right here that I'm holding in my arms. God did it again. God still heals today. Uh, That picture you can put up again, please. Uh, My sister married a man by the name of Brett Norris. The baby's name that they gave was named Chuck (laughs) Norris. Take that, devil! Chuck Norris, dear! Kick that in the face! If you have no idea who Chuck Norris is because you're 13 years old and you're sitting next to your grandma who's who's like, oh my word, I can't believe it. (laughs) Just Google Chuck Norris and your day will be made. You'll find your new series to watch. Sorry, parents, I don't actually endorse that. You can talk to your kid about that. Chuck Norris, can't make that up. God still heals today. But for some of you, it's actually hard to hear some of this because just Friday night, a teenager in the youth group walks up to me and says, I have a disease and it's been a disease for a long time. How come God hasn't healed me? Or what about all the families in the cancer hospital wing? Where as a teenage boy, I'm going to all their funerals because God didn't heal them. So the whole God still heals today, we can clap for that because he does. 
But what about the people who are sitting there saying, but what about me? Today, I want to teach our church this gift that God wanted to give the church, that God wanted to know about, this gift called healing. I am going to fly through these points, take notes. If you miss something, go back and watch it. It will be live stream. It will be on the sermons. But I have some equipping I need to do with you from God's word to help you understand some things about this gift. Number one is this, if you're taking notes. God wants you informed about his plan for you. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed. In other words, God has a plan for every single person sitting in the seat. God has a plan for you. And in another letter in Romans, Paul writes this in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, by the way, this is real good no matter where you're at for every person in the room. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of, of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not have all the same function. In other words, the person you're sitting next to is different than you. We're all one body, but we all have different functions. It goes on to say this. So in Christ, we though many, where well, there's a lot of us here today, although we form one body, each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts. There it is. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Meaning this, the spiritual gifts that Paul lays out in 1 Corinthians can't be earned. They can't be just like earned, but they are graced. They're God's grace on your life. And all of us have different gifts. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. The next verse, and then it says this. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generous. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. I wanted the whole church to know something today, and it's this. God's church isn't divided between the gifted and the ungifted. God has gifts for every single person sitting in the chair right now. And it was never meant to just be the pastor who gets down with oil and just starts anointing everyone and now God's healing everyone through the pastor. It wasn't God's will to make pastors famous and everybody wanna follow them. It was actually God's will for the whole church to be a part of God's plan on the earth for the common good to use every single person sitting in the seat. So if you thought it was just the pastors, let me tell you, God has given you gifts too. Every single one of us. You know, can you imagine going to a dentist? By the way, I hate the dentist. If you are a dentist and you're attending here, I love you. I just hate when they work on my teeth. I don't like it. But can you imagine going to the dentist's office and the dentist has you lay down in the chair? And then he just stares at you? And you're like, dentist, I, uh, I'm paying you. You're on the clock. But he just keeps staring at you. And then the dentist looks at you and says this. I don't know what happened, but uh, I don't seem to have my tools today, so I'll just keep staring at you. You know what a dentist needs to be a dentist? Tools. You know what a carpenter and a plumber need to show up and start working? They need tools. You know what the Holy Spirit gave the church? Tools. For some, he gave the gift of faith to pull out. Some of us would have faith. Some of us would have this gift of miracles. Some of us would have this special, uh, this special message of wisdom. He gave nine different categories of gifts of the Spirit. And then there's this gift called healing. And that God would want to use tools to give not just to the pastor but would want to distribute all the gifts to all the church members, all the people in church, so that it might be used for number two. And here's number two is this. Is that the gifts were given for the common good. 
It says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, it says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. In other words, God didn't give tools to make you look great. God gave you tools to help be a blessing to other people. To be a blessing for the common good. That when we come to church and we're a part of the church, it's meant to be for the common good. Know what I loved when I was here earlier this week? There was a, a youth leader who walked up to me and said, Micah, we're all going to go pray for this guy who's sick. He's not feeling well. You know what I'm hearing? I'm hearing a volunteer youth leader say, hey, we have faith in Jesus, and we just want to work for the common good and see, see other people get helped, see other people be healed. That is what gifts were given for. And then number three, the Spirit gives people the gift to bring the healing. You notice what it says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9. It says this. It says, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. Do you notice how the text says gifts, meaning plural? God didn't just want to heal physically, but the Spirit gives us this gift to See, healings, like gifts of healing, multiple healings. We as humans, we are made up of body, mind, soul. So what kind of healings will there be but physical healings, emotional healings, mental healings, spiritual healings? So much of Jesus' ministry wasn't just physical healing. It was setting people free who were bound with demons. Healings. You notice it says gifts of healing, not gift of healing. A lot of the other gifts, it says gift. This is plural. This means something for us. It means this. God doesn't just care to heal physically. God cares to heal the whole person. You know one of the number one prayer requests I get when I travel across America and preach? Is the amount of teenagers who feel crippled by fear, by anxiety, I worry. Um, I've gotten so many messages in the past year from teenagers saying, my depression is gone. My anxiety is gone. I just met with a girl last night in the green room with some leaders, and she said, God healed me of six disorders that were all psychological, social, and mental. I found it interesting, this pastor in Africa, he says, you want to know why you see so few healings in America? I said, why, sir? He said, because in America you have hospitals, you have money. And in Africa we have none of that. So for us to see healings, all we have is Jesus. And so we see healings all the time. Which, I need to make this reference point right now when it comes to healing. All healing comes from God. All healing comes from God. God is using the doctor just down the street to bring healing to the seven-year-old who needs medicine. God's using the surgeon who just put a new heart inside of someone to bring healing in their heart. All healing comes from God. But the gifts of healing, God wants to give that to his church, to be to pray for one another, to have faith. Number four is this. Jesus is the healer and not you. Jesus is the healer and not you. Look at what Acts 3.16 says on the screen. Uh, Peter and John see this man healed, and they're coming to him like, oh, that's crazy. And he says this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and no, was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. In other words, Jesus was the point all along, not you and I. Jesus is the one who heals. When you watch Jesus minister, you know what he can't stop being moved by? He can't stop being moved by sick people, people who are hurt, people who are physically ill, people who are going to die. The heart of Jesus and the character of Jesus is Christ as healer. Jesus is always the healer. So when it comes to operating in this gift, you and I don't go up to people and say, I'm a healer. You don't say that. Jesus is the healer.
And Jesus gives us a gift to be able to pray, to believe, to see others healed. And then number five, make it about the gift giver and not the gift. Make it about the gift giver and not the gift. It's for the common good. This gift was given to you not to glorify you. This gift was given to you to glorify God. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, when I give you my Holy Spirit, I'm giving you my Holy Spirit so that my Father in heaven may be glorified. In other words, the Holy Spirit exists to dwell in you, not to make your name great, but to make the name of Jesus great. So that when people are healed, what does it do? It brings glory to the glory of God. So make it about the giver, not the gift. Here's a couple things not to do when God gives you this gift of healing, okay? Number one is this. Don't look at someone and tell them something's wrong with them if they aren't healed. No, I'm being serious. You're like, no, this is elemental. I'd never do that. No, church people can say some things that maybe they don't mean it with what they intended, but it hurts. Don't look at someone after you pray for them and say, are you healed? Well, no, I'm not healed. Well, then something's wrong with you. Don't say that, and then don't say this. Number two, don't accuse people that they lack the faith, and that's why they aren't healed. Do you realize the sick person you're praying for wants to be healed? They don't want to be in sickness anymore. They don't want to carry this anymore. They want healing probably more than you want the healing for them. Don't look at them and say, well, you just have too little faith. Don't accuse them of that. Paul says, let what comes out of your mouth be for the edification and building up of other people. If it doesn't build them, don't say it. And then, don't make it about you, don't make it about them, make it all about Jesus. This young teenage boy on Friday night who came up to me and said, how come God hasn't healed me? Those are the questions, like, I just grieve with people over. And know what I told this young boy? And you can do the same when you pray and you operate in the gift of healing. You can do this. You can say, hey, you know what, buddy? I don't know why God hasn't healed you yet, but you know what I'm going to believe? I'm going to believe right now, and I'm going to pray with you, that God is going to heal you right now. But listen to me, young man. Listen to me. God is so faithful even when you ask him to heal it and take it away. But here's what I do know, young man. Even if you ask multiple times, even like Paul, three times and he doesn't take it away, know what Christ will always do for you. He'll always give you the grace to be sufficient in your weakness. He'll see you through. And he is faithful through healing. He is faithful through not healing. And then I told him this. I looked at the young man and I say, you will be healed today. You'll be healed someday. Or you will be healed in eternity forever with Jesus. God's heart is to heal. It's coming. His healing is coming. And it's either coming today, someday, or in eternity with Jesus. Number six, eagerly desire the gift and then step out in faith. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1 says this, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Church, look at me. It is not selfish to ask God to give you the gift of healing. It is not. It is selfish to ask God to give you the gift of healing if it, if it, if it props you up versus giving glory to God. That's when it's selfish. But know what Paul tells the church to do? Ask! Desire it! Go after it! Like, ask God for it. That's biblical to do that. Desire the gifts. I ask God regularly to operate in two gifts, the gifts of prophecy and the gifts of healing. In my travel ministry, I want to operate in those two gifts, healing, prophecy. That's just what I eagerly desire for. That's what I ask God for. There's a list of gifts that God wants to use for you, that God wants to give you, but ask God for it. Here's a couple of do's. I gave you a couple of don'ts. Here's a couple of do's when it comes to healing. Ask in Jesus' name. Ask in the name of Jesus. 
It's the name of Jesus that has power. It's the name of Jesus that heals people. So when you're praying for someone, ask in Jesus' name. Number two, continue to pray until you see healing. Keep praying. Jesus gives us an example in the persistent widow who asks day and night, keeps praying, keeps asking. And Jesus says, if someone asks, will I not give them good gifts in return? Keep asking. Um, if, 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 if I were to show you my, my list who I pray for, I pray for those every single day who need healing, who need a miracle. And know what's really fun? is crossing off the list and watching God answer those prayers. So fun. Within the last year... I've watched couples who can't get pregnant get pregnant, cross them off the list. Within the last year, I watched my friend who has cancer get healed of cancer. Within the last year, I, there's a guy who came up to me just two weeks ago, said, my daughter's going to die. She has tumors all over her body. She needs a miracle. I just real quickly, in a prayer of faith in Jesus' name, prayed for his daughter. I saw him last Sunday. He said, my daughter has no more tumors in her body whatsoever. She's completely healed, completely free of all sickness. God healed my daughter. Sometimes healing comes immediately. Sometimes healing comes through a process. Keep asking. And then number three, thank Jesus for when he does heal them. Thank Jesus. Ten lepers were healed. Only one come back thanking Jesus. And then number four, healing will come either today, someday, or forever in eternity. And my last point today, number seven, my final point is this is all physical healing is demonstration of God's power, but it's still temporary. The greatest healing will always be the one that is eternal. All physical healing is demonstration of God's power, but it's still temporary. You're like, stop right there, it's not temporary. Are you gonna live to be 2,000 years old? Are you? Because last I checked, the same Bible says humans are like those that are wasting away. And God knows the days. He knows the times. In other words, all of us came from a mom. But all of us will one day pass away. Our physical bodies will be no more. So yes, it was demonstration of God's power. But the healing that lasts forever is what you see in Mark chapter 2 when a paralyzed man is sat in front of Jesus. You notice what Jesus does? He doesn't heal the man right away. He forgives the man of his sins. You know what that tells me? God's priority is the salvation of lost people. And then the healing will come back around and demonstrate his power to that person at the same time. You notice how he said, son, your sins are forgiven. There was a car mechanic that we prayed for every day. My dad actually used to visit him years ago and talk to him about Jesus. This car mechanic wanted nothing to do with Jesus. He was a Vietnam vet, hates God, Wants nothing to do with Jesus. My dad passed away in 2009 from a motorcycle accident. But my dad sowed seeds a long time ago with this mechanic. I'm getting my car worked on. I'm about to leave. He said, Micah. I walk over to him. I go, what's up? He said, um, would you pray for me? My eyes got wide-eyed. You want nothing to do with Jesus. And now you want, like, what's going on? He said, um, I have lung cancer. And the doctor doesn't think I have much longer to live. I looked at him and I said, Rich, I'm going to pray for you every day till we see you healed. I've watched God do so many healings. Rich, God's going to heal you. And this is what I thought. God is going to physically heal Rich to show him how faithful he is. And then Rich will want to give his life to Jesus. God gave gifts for the common good. God gave gifts to the church for the good of others. I'm praying every day. I get a call. Micah, would you visit me in the hospital? I'm draining fluid, uh, two liters of fluid every day from my lungs. The doctor doesn't think I have much longer. Would you come? I said, I'll come, Rich. I walked into the hospital room. 
and I sit next to his bedside and I prayed for him again for healing and I'm about to leave. He says, Mike, I have a question. He said, what happens to me when I die? And I sat next to his bedside again. I said, Rich, I said, can I tell you about the love of Jesus? For years, he's looked at my dad and said, forget God, stop talking to me about it. I say, Rich, can I tell you about the love of Jesus? He goes, yeah. I say, Rich, do you know what sin is? And he goes, I'm the worst sinner there ever was. You don't know what I saw at Vietnam. You don't know what I've done in my life. I'm the worst sinner. I said, Rich, I know what it means to be a sinner too. I said, Rich, you know how you've sinned? You know how I've sinned? He goes, yeah. I go, Rich, know what's amazing about Jesus? He goes, what? I said, Rich, while you and I were at our worst sinning in life, Christ loved you so much that he came and died for you, Rich, that whoever might believe in Jesus wouldn't perish, but would have everlasting life in following Jesus. I said, Rich, do you want to receive that love in your life? Do you want to repent of your sin and follow Jesus? Rich starts crying in his hospital bed. This grown big man, Vietnam vet, starts breaking down. He says, yes. Right there, I lead Rich to Jesus. When we say amen together, Rich lets out this audible gasp, and he goes and says this. He says, that was the most glorious moment of my entire life. I lead this man to Jesus, and I look at Rich, I'm about to leave. I said, Rich, God has taken the old and given you new. Your sins are washed away, Rich. Rich, you're going to spend forever with Jesus. And Rich, I believe God's still going to heal you. I walk out of the hospital room, I get a call two days later that Rich had passed away and is now in eternity for heaven, forever with Jesus. I asked for a physical miracle. Instead, God showed me an eternal miracle that lasts forever. I got to do Rich's funeral. About 500 of his car mechanic clients that he serviced was there. And about 250 of his friends gave their life to Jesus. I prayed to Jesus every day for healing for one man. I didn't know Jesus was going to multiply the prayer and see 250 men come to know Jesus. He gives his church gifts. And for everyone who showed up in the room, I wish I could give every person a tool to walk away with to remind you that you are called, that God's given you gifts. And it's through the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. Ask Him for it. Step out in faith. Believe Jesus. If everyone could bow their head, close their eyes, no one looking around. I talked a lot today about physical healing and healing, but it's possible you're a teenage kid and you were drugged to church because your mom wanted you here. It's possible you're a young adult just visiting and you're not sure where you're at with Jesus. You know what the greatest miracle is? It's seeing your heart surrendered to the love of Jesus, your sins forgiven. It's seeing God heal you from the inside out. If you're here and you're saying, hey, I'm lost, I'm a sinner, I'm in a dark spot, I need Jesus to save me. Today's good news for you. Jesus wants to save you today. If you are far from Christ, you're not living for Christ, you're not right with Jesus, I just want you to slip up a hand, no one looking around, saying, hey, I want to give my life to Jesus today. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I'm in a dark spot. Praise God. Any other hands? Saying, hey, I want to give my life so cool, so awesome. Anybody else? Just slip up a hand so I can see it. So cool. Church, can we all pray this together? There are hands that went up. This is a day of salvation, a day of healing. Church, can we pray this together, all of us? Just say, Jesus. Come on, all of us. Say, Jesus. I'm lost, but today I'm found. 
thank you for saving me. Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you heal me? Would you help me to follow you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, can we clap for those people who are saying, hey, I want to follow Jesus. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. A couple of things you need to know before you leave today. Pastor Austin's going to sing this song for a couple minutes, not long. When he sings, two things I want to let you know about. One, would you consider coming back tonight? Because tonight we're going to pray for healing for those who need healing. Would you consider coming back tonight? And then two, as he's singing this song, between you and the Holy Spirit, would you eagerly desire the gift giver? Would you eagerly desire, just ask Jesus, God, would you give me the gift of healing? Ask him. If that resonates with you, that's in your heart, ask God for that as he sings. Ask God for that. And then practice that. Come tonight, pray for others. God wants to use his church. He's given the church gifts for the common good to bring glory to Jesus. Would you stand with me as we sing this song together?